the generation of thinkers that produced Corbyn, that produced the modern day Labour Party, have fundamentally failed. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kisson. And this is a show for you if you're bored with people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our brilliant guest this week is a returning guest to Trigonometry in the wake of the election. We're delighted to have him back. He's a professor at the University of Kent and the author of National Populism, A Revolt Against Liberal Democracy. Mike Goodwin, welcome back to Trigonometry. Thanks for having me again. It's good to have you back. It was a long intro. I hope I got all of it right. I'm pretty sure I have. Yeah. Uh, we're delighted to have you back. It's been a week since the election as we're recording this. What went wrong or what went right? Well, uh, has it been a week already? Um, yes. Okay. Um, I'm still sort of in the whirlwind of post-election chaos. Um, well, look, I mean, this was a, uh, a realignment election in many ways. This was um, the largest conservative majority since 1987, their highest share of the vote since 1979. And interestingly for me, actually, it was the fourth consecutive time that the conservative vote share increased since 2010. Now, we've got a nice whole sort of literature on the costs of governing and incumbency effects and parties that are in government tending to lose. This was a curious case of an incumbent party actually increasing its vote share. But for Labour, I mean, the vote was absolutely devastating, worst performance since 1935, um, has now, you know, people keep saying to me, this is like 1983, Michael Foote. Mm. Uh, it's a lot worse for Labour <laughs> than 1983. 1983, they still had... Uh, they were still the largest party in Scotland. They still had most of their northern heartlands. Um, but now Labour are being really chased out of both of those mm -hmm. things. And listening to the um, prospective leadership candidates this week after the election, I don't think anybody has a convincing, um, coherent explanation for why the Labour Party is in this mess. And I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to that. But the other thing here about this election was just looking at the role of class, looking at just how successful a party led by um, a graduate of Eton and Oxford was among the working class going into those Labour heartland areas, you know, Blythe Valley, Don Valley, Wakefield, and converting areas that in some cases haven't been conservative since the 1930s and others cases haven't been conservative at any other point in our political history. And, and so on one level, this is about British politics, but obviously on another level, this is about the broader realignment the new culture divide in our politics that is sweeping across many advanced Western democracies. And we saw a Conservative Party really cleaning up in areas that the Labour Party had been founded to represent. And that now really has ushered in a, an existential crisis to a party that still defines itself as a working class party, but is really no more a party of the working class. It's an incredible transformation. And before you jump in, Francis, I just want to ask this. It's You talk about the realignment. And really, I think this is the bit in your book, which we, you talk about all of this. You've predict, you've been predicting this stuff for 15, 20 years, I'm, I think it's fair to say. In fact, you actually advised Ed Miliband and his team about this, right? And it doesn't seem like they particularly listened, did they? Well, that's, so that's quite an interesting story. Um, Go back five years ago, um, we wrote a book, myself and Robert Ford at the University of Manchester, uh, wrote a book called Revolt on the Right, which was basically looking at um, the rise of new divides in Britain, in particular the rise of Nigel Farage and the UK Independence Party, but it was more about actually how British politics and society were changing. And one of the key arguments of that book essentially is that you have a large number of voters that felt left behind, not just economically, mm. which is where the left goes wrong, they only can view this in terms of economics, um, but actually they felt left behind in terms of their values, that there had been a, a new set of socially, culturally liberal values that they neither shared nor respected that was now being imposed upon them by political elites and the media, uh, and they felt like they couldn't really relate to those values, whether it's sort of strong support for the European Union, um, strong support for large scale migration, you know, and all the new identity politics stuff that, that you talk a lot about on your show. And um, when we came out with this book and we said, look, actually, Labour's got to worry about this just as much as the Conservatives, because the dominant view at that point was that 
Nigel Farage and UKIP were really only hitting the Conservatives. And a lot of Labour MPs were very cross about it. We got a lot of criticism. And um, randomly, one day I got an email saying, you know, do you want to come and present the findings of the book to Ed Miliband's team? And um, this was this was just before the 2014 European Parliament elections, when, uh, of course, Farage did, did very well and Labour did very poorly. And um, anyway, so Rob and I went in and we presented to Ed Miliband's uh, um, advisors, um, and we finished this presentation explaining why Labour's relationship with the working class was weakening, and why they they were basically in for a long term problem from uh, Euroscepticism and and social conservatism, and uh, it finished, and there, there wasn't a single question, just silence. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. See you later. Basically. Sounds like one of my gigs, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but then on the same day, I think it was, we walked across the street and presented the same, exact same presentation to Linton Crosby, mm. who at that time was running David Cameron's election campaigning. I think it was on the same day. And because, you know, we have to offer a search to all the parties and, you know, make sure everybody has a chance to, to talk about it. And it, Linton Crosby was the only person in the room. And Rob and I sort of presented it. And at the end of the presentation... I mean, I, we got a grilling that you really only get if you present papers at the sort of infamous seminars in mm. at Oxford or, um, um, you know, uh, Cambridge. I mean, um, he was really on it. Mm -hmm. You know, how did you measure this? Uh, when did that happen? Mm -hmm. What do they think about this? What do they think about that? And I remember walking out and, and just thinking, that guy really, really knows his stuff. Mm -hmm. Really, really. I mean, he, he could basically see what was coming. Yeah. And I think on the Labour side, there was this entrenched resistance to accepting that their electorate had become structurally unsound. But also, the only interpretation they had that could make sense was to draw on the kind of old Marxist lines and say, well, this is basically just about economic insecurity and let's just give these people better wages and, you know, let's just talk about this in terms of a growth story, an austerity story. Whereas what the right had understood was that actually this was much more a story about values and people feeling as though their identities were being challenged by these new issues, migration, EU membership, globalization, and so on. And that day, in effect, really tells us a lot about what happened over the next five years, because as we've now discovered, you know, Labour, Labour's relationship really has become much weaker with its traditional heartlands. And it's a story that's about sequencing, right? I mean, listening to the prospective um, post-Corbyn leadership candidates say, this is just about Brexit, this is just about um, what happened during the 2019 campaign, this is just about Jeremy Corbyn. Actually, the evidence is very clear. What happens is basically from the late 90s, early 2000s, you get the rise of New Labour and Blair. The differences between the parties become blurred. People stop talking about class differences so much, including the media. Post-2001, you then start seeing working class voters abstaining, not voting uh, anywhere near the same levels that they, they had been previously. And as you go through the 2000s, you can begin to see something is fundamentally wrong in the Labour heartlands. Then enter Farage. UKIP start to cultivate those areas, disrupting those long-term tribal allegiances. And you go through the coalition government with Farage going into these labor areas, Haywood and Middleton and um, the Northeast and, and parts of the Midlands, and basically cultivating this disillusionment, this sense that there is this distant metropolitan elite that's no longer interested in your life. And then by the time you get into 2015 and Cameron, he actually scoops up quite a lot of those voters. But by the time you get to 2016 and the referendum, a lot of those areas, as we now know, 60% were then, 60% uh, of Labour held seats opted to leave the European Union. And a lot of people who had given up on politics came back into politics to vote for Brexit. So then by the time Johnson turns up, right, and Dominic Cummings turn up, what they've effectively diagnosed, I mean, Nick Timothy reached the same conclusion, but the execution was very poor. But what they what they recognized was that in effect, the stage had been set for a much wider realignment. And crucially, they made a, a strategic change. They held the line on questions of culture and identity by saying, we will deliver Brexit. We will reform migration. We will toughen up on crime. We will clamp down on Islamist terrorists. 
But on the economic axis, they leaned a little bit more left. They said, we're mm. going to increase spending on the NHS, increase spending on infrastructure, raise the minimum wage, tackle regional inequalities, reboot the Northern powerhouse. And what they grasped was a fundamental new rule of politics, which is that it's easier for the right to move left on economics than it is for the left to move right on identity and culture. And David Goodhart and Eric Kaufman and myself and others have been making this argument for many, many years. Including on this show. Including yeah. on the show, which is that the Labour, the Labour Party simply no longer has the vocabulary that is needed to reconnect with these voters that don't just want to talk about economic insecurity, but they want to talk as much about cultural insecurity. And this election, to me, I think really hammered home those key messages. Uh, and that's why I, I don't think there will be any quick recovery for the Labour Party, because listening to the prospective leadership candidates, they just have a, f they just, they cannot comprehend what's happened and why it's happened. Um, so I think we're in for an interesting ride. Do you think part of it as well, and I'm going to use quite an unkind word to describe some of the Labour Party members, is cowardice? that they're not willing to address these issues. That the moment you have working class people come to them and talk about things like immigration and their fears, they don't know how to deal with it, so they slap the racism word, the intolerance, the bigotry, and therefore they can just dismiss it. Well, I think in effect what's been happening, I'm won over by Thomas Piketty, who talks a lot about inequality, but, but has now, I think, more recently been looking at the way our parties have evolved. I'm won over by his argument that, in effect, what happened prior to 2019 was that our two main parties had been captured. And on the left, the Labour Party had been captured by a highly socially, culturally liberal Brahmin left that was, in effect, more interested in identity politics, um, wasn't particularly bothered about economic redistribution, um, had come through the elite universities, the elite social networks, was broadly insulated from the effects of globalization, and was really only interested in expressing virtue and moral superiority, and certainly not really that interested in expressing class or economic solidarity with, with workers. But on the right, at the same time, the conservative centre-right parties had been captured by this merchant elite, a business elite that mm. was really only interested in deregulation, um, economic liberalism, putting free market capitalism on steroids. And Piketty's argument certainly is convincing in that that basically leaves a large number of voters, millions of voters around the world basically not represented because your average voter instinctively wants a little bit more economic protection and a little bit more cultural protection. That's basically the winning formula of our, of our time. And I would argue that culture's in the driving seat and, and economics is sitting next door in the passenger seat, still playing a role, but not quite as dominant as culture. Um, and then you know, what, what, what's interesting about that is Johnson and Cummings basically then recognized that that wasn't going to be able to get them the territory and the seats that they needed, and they needed to, in effect, return more to the sort of Disraeli tradition of conservative mm. politics and the Thatcher tradition. And that really unlocks the, the door to a lot of those Labour leave seats. And so prior to this election, a lot of left-wing parties in Europe, because social democracy is fundamentally in crisis. I mean, the people who say this is all about Jeremy Corbyn, this is all about Brexit, mm. one of the, I think one of the interesting questions they all ignore is, well, why is social democracy in general in crisis? Why are centre-left parties across much of Europe in decline? Because this is fundamentally about a structural problem within their electorate. You can't hold together middle-class liberal professionals, traditional socially conservative workers, and then uh, students, um, you know, sort of Generation Z, millennials, in this kind of broad tent uh, when they hold irreconcilable mm. values and, mm. and attitudes on these new identity issues. You just can't do that. Mm. And so I think Labour don't really have an answer to that. Social democracy has been in decline. Lots of people on the left were looking to Corbyn as, gee, maybe this guy has the answer. <laughs> but now, <laughs> actually, centre-right parties yeah. are looking at Johnson and the Conservatives and saying, well, maybe this cross-class coalition, this kind mm. of British version of... Christian democracy in a strange kind of way, mm. um, maybe this is a compelling formula mm. 
for conservative parties to navigate through these new value divides. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was the first culture war, remember, after the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And the liberal left has lost the first culture war that emerged after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the crisis and, and austerity. And, and it, by extension, it's kind of smashed the central thesis that many on the left have held that, you know, this is still fundamentally about voters who are driven by economic cost benefit mm. calculations. And ever since we shared that research with Miliband going in en you know, countless numbers of times mm. to Parliament to talk to Labour MPs about how they needed to change their position on freedom of movement, mm. how they needed to change their, change their representation of working class communities because mm. the party has been basically dominated gradually over time by middle class um, university educated MPs. And, and they would sort of say, oh yeah, 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 we get it, we get it. And then nothing sort of changes, mm. just carries on the same. Because the, like I say, they don't have the vocabulary, but also they don't have the, um, they don't have the everyday experience to understand uh, where most voters are on these issues, it's easier to say, you know, it's racist, it's mm. it's ignorance, it's it's bigotry. And the more and more they do that, which is why identity politics is so important here, the more and more they are saying to these communities that you are not equal to others, or that in effect, you know, you are pro you are problematic communities. <laughs> um, don't be surprised if they abandon, mm. abandon you en masse. Well, that was the most common comment that people were making on social media. Yeah. I mean, you made this yeah. point, uh, so I'll let you do it. Well, no, it's, well, I made the point that, you know, it's, it's amazing that, you know, you demonize a whole swath, you know, communities of people as racist, intolerant and thick, and then get a bit upset when they don't vote for you. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's, it's as simple as that, really. But what's so ironic is they appointed somebody who you could say on one level was socially conservative, pro-Brexiteer, old school left wing as, as we would deem him, and then they didn't allow him to be any of those things. Do you think they would have done better if they just let Corbyn be Corbyn? <laughs> I, I, Cor I had to ask you, I had to ask the question. I think Corbyn <laughs> was an, will be seen as a very interesting moment in British politics. I think Corbynism, I don't actually, I don't actually disagree with everything that the Labour Party today are saying, particularly on the economy. I think there's a very strong case for going much further with economic reform than we mm. have done. And this, of course, mm. is partly why Blair is still the architect of this period of turbulence and chaos, mm. because when when Labour were in power for such a long period of time, they really didn't do enough to reform financial services, mm. to deal with regional inequality, to rebalance what many voters out there see as being a rigged economic settlement. And in some ways, they're right to feel mm. that. Um, but I think, you know, Corbyn, the problem with Labour generally today is Corbyn's right in a way to say we've got to turn up the volume on economic radicalism, but they've matched that with this sort of social cultural liberalism, mm. which a lot of voters out there now see as being the fundamental problem with the direction of, of society. Mm. So they can't, they're constantly now going to be outflanked by a center right that is now going to speak on both of those mm. flanks. Yeah. It's going to say, we are going to intervene a little bit more to to you know reboot the local economy in the regions but we also now accept and recognize your desire for an australian based point system a tougher approach on knife crime whatever it is right and so the labor party cannot cannot um, meet the conservatives toe to toe on those issues what they should do in my view at least I mean, this is where, you know, you get into a really interesting debate within academia, because what I think the Labour Party needs to do is basically, at least over the short term, um, you can hold the economic line, but they're going to have to change the cultural line. They're going to have to accept that we can't have freedom of movement anymore. We can't have this never ending expansion of social liberalism mm -hmm. and identity politics is just not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and they can try and get away from this narrative that is obsessed with defining everybody according to how they're different from one another, mm. to actually getting back to a narrative that talks about communal and social solidarity and what we share in common, which mm. 
which is what Obama and Blair mm -hmm. and now, ironically, Johnson have, have done so well, which is they're talking about um, much broader identities that are above just saying, well, you know, you're white, male, um, uh, struggling with toxic masculinity. <laughs> yeah, or, I like the fact or, you address that to me. Well, <laughs> we're all we're all white men struggling so with that toxic they, masculinity. And, and, and it's kind of unless the Labour Party actually realistically adjusts, as some centre left parties mm -hmm. in Europe have done, uh -huh. then they will never get over this fragmented well, electorate. And of course, what academics will argue at this point is some academics will say, "Oh, well, you're legitimising." Um, or you're normalizing white supremacism and white nationalism. And that is actually part of the problem <laughs> because the Labour Party and left-wing parties are often most strongly connected to and influenced by thinkers that, that hold the most extreme interpretation of society and are the most committed true believers to the sort of post-60s identity left school of thought, right? And, and that's, that's where... The first thing Labour, the Labour Party should do is completely renew, revitalise, refresh the, the people that it's talking to. Mm. Because, it, it, I mean, the, the generation of thinkers that produced Corbyn, that produced the modern day Labour Party, have fundamentally failed. And they need to start putting themselves in rooms with thinkers and analysts that, that, that hold a very different interpretation of where Britain is and where it's going. And they need to start putting themselves out, outside of their comfort zone. Post-2016, the liberal left, I would argue, has basically covered itself in comfort blankets. It's Cambridge Analytica, it's Russia, it's Brexit, it's Corbyn, it's the big Brexit bus, it's 350 million. Nobody has seriously stepped back and looked at how the underlying deeper currents are reshaping our societies and, and introducing these new tensions into that liberal left electorate. And until they start doing that, they're not going to be able to devise a roadmap back to power. Uh, you know, they're just going to be going round and round in these circles, allowing the right that has recognized these new fundamental rules in politics to, uh, to enjoy a new period of dominance. I think the problem is as well, Matt, is like you were saying, you know, they need to do that. But I know these people. Uh, we are in an industry so which, is, which, is, yeah, <laughs> which is riddled with them. And let's be honest, they show no intention of doing that. I don't think... Uh, I think there are people who get it. I think if you look at the Britain's Labour movement, there have been voices within it. Who, I mean, Blue Labour. Blue Labour, uh, John Crudus, John Denham has been very good on Englishness. And but Paul, em Paul Embry, who we've got on. But none yeah. of those are the momentum lot. Well, this is a classic. I mean, this is John May's law of curvilinear disparity in a way in that he argued in the 70s a problem with parties is they get captured by activists mm. that are much more radical than the electorate and, mm. and what labor is in is this is this great example really of of a party that's been captured by an activist base that is mainly london uh, that is mainly middle class that is mainly university educated hyper liberal hi to, yep so socially liberal has no Resonance understanding of Bolsover and, and Blythe Valley. And my, you know, I came, I mean, academics, I think, um, have also struggled um, because there is not much interaction with those communities. There's a lot of survey work, there's a lot of desk based work, there's a lot of insular conversations that don't open up to people who perhaps have a have an on the ground understanding of those communities. Um, and uh, that's a problem. I mean, it's an intellectual crisis, it's a philosophical crisis, it's an existential crisis for Labour. And after 83, it took them three elections to get back in, mm -hmm. back in the game. And it, it may take three elections this time. Well, they've been out since 2010. Right. Uh, and, but let me ask you this, because this, uh, you mentioned that in Europe, some parties have made the adjustment. How how does a Labour Party successfully make that adjustment now, given that in order to do what you're talking about, they would have to completely shed this loony fringe that they've been wagged by as a dog for, for some time now? They would have to let go of them. They would have to start addressing their concerns back to ordinary to the concerns of ordinary people. They would have to start talking to working class voters in the north and, and, and elsewhere, frankly. How how would they beat, let's say, the Tory party under Johnson, which is doing pretty much the same things? 
Mm. They're addressing the cultural concerns. And now, mm. as you say, the right is moving to the center mm. and maybe even to the left, frankly, mm. if you look at some of the policies mm. on economics. Mm. So how, how, do, how are they, is there even room for a Labour Party anymore? No, oh, of course. I mean, there's lots of room uh, for a party that says we need to radically reform the economy. We need to radically tackle a concentration of, of wealth and tax avoidance mm. and tax evasion. Um, but, but we also need to do much better at representing communities that aren't part of what you might call the liberal consensus. Mm. I mean, the liberal consensus was really only ever shared by a minority. Mm. And that's, you know, liberals routinely exaggerate their, their, the size of their tribe. Um, the economic, social... Um, consensus that, in effect, let's have you know, let's open up markets and let's open up borders, mm. um, is is actually quite a fringe view. Mm. Um, the problem is during the two thousands and so on, we sort of bought into this narrative that this was now the dominant view, mm. and of course we've now discovered, particularly since twenty sixteen, that that it isn't. Mm. So I think for the Labour Party, it means that you know they need to start asking themselves some pretty tough questions about. Um, where has liberalism uh, gone wrong? Um, is it too individualistic? Um, um, has it failed to satisfy people's struggle for recognition, which we always argued it did a very good job of, of, uh, of, of, of doing that? Um, and you know the, uh, the, the reason that liberal democracy, everyone got very excited about the new era of, of liberal dominance in the 90s was because they said, you know, it makes individuals feel recognized by giving them individual rights. Mm -hmm. So it makes you, gives you meaning. Um, but secondly, it married itself with the most dynamic economic system that, that man's ever created. And we can now see how both of those things have come unstuck because we have generations of voters that don't feel recognized, but we also have economic systems that are still um, as part of their DNA, generating inequalities. Mm. And so I think the, the Labour Party needs to step back. I mean, it's remarkable the pace at which they've moved this debate into one of leadership and not one of I ideas. Mm. And ideas have left the building, mm. right? I mean, there's no kind of serious discussion about how social democracy can renew and revive itself intellectually to navigate through these era, this era of value divides, because mm. my thesis is we're at the beginning of a period of realignment, right? That the the, issue, the toxic debates we've had about migration and Brexit, actually this is the beginning of a new era in which um, we're going to have more of these big intense debates that are not so much going to be about um, traditional questions of economic redistribution, they are going to be fundamentally questions about cultural insecurity and whether or not you feel that you are being protected amid the winds of globalization. And that's going to involve things that you talk about on your program regularly from, you know, minority identities through to, you know, demographic change and, and the future of populations that will go through some profound shifts in our lifetime, not, you know, not over the horizon, but in the next 50 years or so. And I think, um, the Labour Party isn't ready to think about that because it is a project that was designed to answer economic questions, yeah. but is now having to rewire itself to answer cultural questions. And it, as you say, um, Francis, it doesn't have it doesn't have the personnel, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the thinkers, yeah. the vocabulary through which it can begin to weave together answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. Now, some social democrats in Scandinavia, for example, have said, actually, we will be a little bit more socially conservative on these questions because actually that will that will bring us power mm. and with power we can <laughs> tackle economic redistribution and we can help workers but then in other parts of the country i'd say britain included there are parts of the left that say no that's that's normalizing white nationalism <laughs> and supremacism that's normalizing power is and what it is congratulations you're in the electoral yeah. wilderness yeah you're in the wilderness enjoy it Enjoy it because you're not going to have power mm. for a long period of time until yeah. you recognise this new law. Will the Tories be able? To, sorry, Francis. Will the Tories be able to hold together their coalition because it's a very new electorate for mm. the Conservative Party as well? Uh, and by the way, for our American viewers, you think Republicans, Conservatives, Democrat, uh, Labour to some extent. I mean, you, you, we'll talk more about that later. And maybe it's a false analogy. But how do they hold together now under Boris Johnson this coalition, which is also a coalition? It's a coalition of working class people who are small C conservative, who mm. maybe never voted for the Tory party ever before. And the, the, the kind of economic right, free market uh, people who, who may have very little in common 
Well, um, the first thing we have to recognise has always been a tradition of working class voters supporting the Conservative mm. Party. So we shouldn't have been too surprised when we saw Johnson go back to something that Thatcher also mm. achieved in the 80s. And this is because Conservatives inherently are aspirational and optimistic. And the Labour Party at times is, is really none of those things. So <laughs> I, love, I love how careful that is being. You've got to word yourself carefully because you've got to play both sides to some extent. Whilst well, wearing a blue jumper. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 so I think that's always allowed the Conservatives to have a shot at winning over blue collar, mm. blue collar Britain. And there are going to be fundamental tensions, but I think the, the, the advantage, the inbuilt advantage that conservatives have is that the tensions over the economic model, Bolsover saying, give me more intervention and protectionism, mm. and Surrey and Hampshire saying, you know, I'm fine, I'm you know, going to Rome this weekend, just give me a bit more economic liberalism. Um, those economic questions, I don't think the tension is as real within the conservative electorate because what those voters share is they, they have a lot more in common on the value mm. dimension. Mm. So they are instinctively socially conservative. So they mm. prioritize <laughs> stability and order and in general conformity and they respect tradition and they want to preserve ways of life and they have that sort of you know, Burkean view of society. And so mm. I think that in general, there is an inbuilt advantage for the conservatives. So long as Johnson is doing what he's doing, which is going up to Sedgefield and saying, I get it, you've, you've lent me your vote. You know, I'm not taking this for granted. I now need to deliver mm. on, you know, <clears throat> reviving coastal Britain and uh, fixing the regions and all of those kinds of things. But they now, the conservative tent fundamentally still shares this basic consensus that it is much better to um, sort of uh, stress stability over constant continual flux. Mm. Mm. And until the liberal left can tell people clearly where it wants to take them, which does not sound like just endless change, endless globalization, endless, endless fluctuation and uh, instability. It's always going to struggle in this era, particularly to meet conservatives head on. Um, so I think it will be a challenge for the conservatives to hold the electorate. I don't actually think it's going to be as difficult as people think, because underpinning it at a foundational level, these voters actually you know, do have a lot in common. If you put somebody from Bolsover in a room with somebody from, you know, um, Kensington and Chelsea, right? They might disagree on on economics a bit, but they will fundamentally agree those conservative voters on, you know, let's moderate migration, let's uphold institutions, let's do what we can to stop someone like Jeremy Corbyn getting into power. Um, let's let's prioritise stability and order and tradition. But if you put a Labour voter from Hampstead in a room with a Labour voter from Hartlepool, <laughs> I just imagined it. because one is prioritising social liberalism, yeah. mm. right, aggressively and defines itself yeah, yeah. through this moral superiority complex, mm. then forget about it. There's no common ground there at all. If anything, there's just going to be this tendency to sort of disdain, look disdainfully mm. and negatively on on their... It's like a woke comedian co going to talk, to talk about Brexit for 10 minutes somewhere up north. Well, that's basically what you're talking about. Just uh, yeah. it's a fundamental value divide. But uh, Brexit, to, I mean, Brexit to me wasn't surprising. I think, I mean, what surprised me was the extent to which people were surprised by yeah. Brexit. And what surprises me now is the extent to which people are surprised by the Conservative Well, we weren't majority. because we've been talking to people like you. But it's amazing how ignorant people were of this issue and the stuff that you talk about more broadly. I mean, the vast majority of people I know completely didn't expect this. I, I bet somebody 50 quid that it was going to happen because to me it was just like a no-brainer. Mm. Because having had the conversations with you and with David Goodhart and with Eric mm. Kaufman, it, it's, it's just transparent, isn't it? I mean, you and I had no doubt about no, this. No, 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 no. We, we, we both knew that it was going to happen. But, you know, what these people do is they ingest a narrative, which you know, mm. on, the, on the far left, the momentum crowd, and then they just regurgitate this narrative. But it doesn't bear analysing, mm. and it's got no basis in reality. But, but if you come in there, what's also been quite clear over the last week is that they don't, um, I mean... I'd be rude, but they don't read. They don't actually engage with <laughs> the research. Like, for example, yeah, yeah. Capitalism and Social Democracy, which is a great book, 1985, yeah. predicted all of this. It said, yeah. you know, Social Democracy's electorate is going to gradually over time become increasingly incoherent and divided between 
the expansion of the university educated middle class and the remaining socially conservative working class voters mm. and social democrat parties will face a choice about mm. how they manage that. And then in this country for the last 25 years, we've had loads of good research. Uh, Jeff Evans at uh, Oxford, James Tilley, Oliver Heath, um, uh, David Cutts and others um, who have all shown the coming storm for the Labour Party that you know, the, the, the soil had been cultivated before Johnson even became leader, before May even mm. became leader of the Conservatives. But nobody was thinking seriously about how to respond to that in a meaningful sense. And the only people who were, you know, Blue Labour mm. and, 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 and others, the only people who were actually thinking about this mm. were then sort of widely criticised and disparaged as mm. being sort of sympathisers of the right <laughs> or being, you know, um, sort of normalisers. And, and then you just realise that, I think you mentioned this earlier, alluded to it, that there are people, you know, the Labour Party needs to have a very serious conversation, but doesn't really seem at all interested in having that conversation. It doesn't, because it goes back and, you know, I raise Venezuela as an example. You know, they have a narrative and once their narrative no longer works, then they either shut down, or ignore it, or they move on to something else. Should, should we be concerned, Matt? Because uh, I personally believe that whatever government is in power, we need a strong and credible opposition to mm. challenge that government. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and given what you're saying, it sounds like the Labour Party is going to spend, let's say, a decade in the wilderness, at, at least. Uh, Boris Johnson has got a huge majority. Is he going to be able to kind of just bull in the china shop this and just do whatever the hell he wants with no one really opposing him properly i think i think i completely agree with you what actually make what worries me about british politics is the is the weakness and the incoherence of the opposition mm. i mean the post 2016 environment has been you know dominated by um, uh, a sort of a, a socially conservative um, worldview, um, while the Remain camp, the liberal left camp, have essentially been fragmented and divided. And I really genuinely don't think that's a good thing. I, I would like to have a vibrant, strong opposition. The problem now, I think, for the liberal left parties is the conservatives with the majority they've got, even though they've won the culture war, they've not really won the war that determines cultural hegemony, mm. right? So they are now, I think, going to turn to asking deeper questions, not just about what's the policy program, but how do you push back against the liberal left dominance that is reflected in certain media out outlets, is reflected in certain educational establishments, and is the sort of high culture, um, you know, sort of soft left norms, how do you push back against that? So I think the challenge to the, the left, as we see it now, in the rubble of the election is electoral. The challenge that is coming is going to be fundamentally intellectual and cultural. Mm. And I, th I can see among conservatives after this election, there is now a real appetite for saying there's no point winning elections if over the long term you're still losing the culture war. Yeah. You're still having all of these key institutions and educational establishments and elsewhere, they're still being captured, right, by um, uh, a view that undermines your long term. Uh, uh, success and credibility. So I think the Johnson government will probably now go go further than most conservative governments, probably since the Thatcher era, at saying it's not enough to pass policy. Actually, now there needs to be a broader pushback against many of the things you talk about in your program. State funding for non-woke comedians <laughs> yeah. and shows like trigonometry. Sounds good to me. Sign me up. Oh, uh, yeah. Cancelling gender studies courses. <laughs> but there's a question I wanted to ask you, because we've been focusing a lot on England, which... You know, it's fine and it's important. Britain. Uh, no, well, but we haven't spoken about Scotland, uh, actually. Okay. Right, OK. I just thought you were being racist as no, usual. Well, no. no, that's just my voice, mate. Right. <laughs> but we look at Scotland. Scotland voted entirely, almost entirely for the SNP. Mm. Are we going to get another referendum? Mm. And mm. if we do, are we going to say goodbye to Scotland? Great question. I don't think we're going to get one during this 
current government. I think the Conservative and Unionist Party will do everything within its power to stop that from happening. I think as we go into 2020, the SNP is going to have a number of distractions and problems that's going to, I think, um, expose uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's some weaknesses within the within within the movement, um, and of course, I think for the Labour Party as well. You know, what happened in Scotland was so devastating because essentially it takes away. Firstly, it takes away their ability to win a majority. So the best the Labour government can hope, sorry, the Labour opposition can hope for, <laughs> uh, the Labour opposition can hope for is, is some form of minority government, hung, hung parliament, coalition in the future. But, but the second thing Scotland reminds us about is just how quickly radical political change mm. can happen mm. and how comprehensive it can be. And when you look at other regions of the country, you look at Wales, for example, there was that moment just before the election where it looked like Wales might begin to sort of move toward a similar kind of realignment that we that we saw in in, in Scotland, um, and that that's why I think it's significant. I don't think we're going to have a referendum in the next few years. Um, but the deeper questions, I mean, you know, the longer this goes on, there is a much deeper question too that we're going to have to really interrogate, which is what where does all of this leave England, and where does all of this leave Englishness? And how are we going to respond to um, a movement that has, for many years, felt that it is not represented politically and socially, um, and doesn't have institutions in the same way that other uh, uh, identities do? And so, I think Englishness is going to come back onto the agenda quite quite soon. It's interesting. It's a great question, by the way, yeah. about Scotland. I thought you were going to go to America um, no. when you were talking about it. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Do you think the, the United Kingdom will be the same configuration in 20 or 30 years from now as it is now? I mean, who? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You don't know? I, I don't know. I, 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 I think we, uh, we have a fragmenting settlement, mm. um, and that's very clear. And I think the union in general is going to struggle uh, in a very significant way. Um, and it comes back to that point about sort of commonality and what are the shared bonds that people in the United Kingdom now have. And with these value divides, because they're becoming so, because there's a very strong regional dimension to them, what, what you've seen over the last few years is that leave seats have gradually gone further and further to the Conservatives. Remain seats have gone further and further towards Labour and the Lib, Lib Dems. And of course, in Scotland, there is a a sort of a, a, a very strong kind of Remain majority anchored, you know, partly through um, the SNP. And I think you're, you're, you're seeing the kind of growing cracks, the widening cracks, and it's not easy to see how those are going to be put back together, especially when you consider that um, Brexit was only one manifestation mm. of these value divides. Mm. So we've become obsessed with the idea that Brexit is kind of all encompassing and exclusive. But Brexit is really only one spin off from these underlying value divides between liberals and conservatives, right? So there are going to be many others. And those two will hit the union and they will challenge the traditional left right allegiances that we've had, and they may involve questions again about migration and demographic change. They might involve questions around new minority identities. They might involve questions around security and terrorism. We, we don't know where we'll be 30, 40 years from now. Mm. But I think that is going to be um, something, again, the main parties, the parties that win during this period of value change are the parties that are going to adapt. And the parties that don't adapt, aka Labour, are going to struggle. And do you think, moving on from that, are we going to face further, dem well, further pressure for a united Ireland as well? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, I think so. Uh, and I think watching how Ireland responds over the next year or two mm. years with regards to the you know, Brexit now being formalised and post-January Remain is going to transition into rejoin, mm. and certain things that we spent three years debating will be now final. Yeah. And certain tactical battles will turn into generational mm. battles. Yes. Uh, and that's why, actually, by the way, I think a lot of people have found the 2019 election so difficult because the magnitude of what's been changed by the result, um, also with regards to Ireland, is so huge mm. that people are only now beginning to sort of think about it and digest it.
Let's look forward, Matt. Uh, <clears throat> one of the d the biggest, I think, events of next year will be the election campaign mm. in the United States, where all of this is going to play out on what is a much bigger uh, stage. Mm. Um, <clears throat> what do you see having... Again, just to be clear for our viewers and listeners, you've been vindicated on all this stuff after talking about it for many, 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 many years, not the last five years. You've been talking about it for 15 years at least. What do you see for that going forward? And uh, are we going to see a kind of massive Trump victory, uh, Bojo style uh, defeat for the Democrats? And first of all, actually, let me ask you this. How are, do you think they're going to respond? Are they going to, is, is the question for them going to be, the lesson for us from this labor loss is they didn't go far enough left. Is that what they're going to think? Or are they going to say, no, no, we, we're going we're gonna to actually come back to, to the center? Well, I hope the Democrats realize that going to the radical left is not a vote winner. Telling a working class family in Wisconsin that you might now have to pay more tax in order to make reparations for the sins of your ancestors, that kind of stuff is not going to be a vote winner. Hold but, on, is it not a good idea to ask a working class person about their pronouns? <laughs> but I think also... Uh, <laughs> I might just ignores any questions he doesn't like. Desperately trying not to make more enemies. Uh, <laughs> that's my, 20, my New Year's resolution. Just <laughs> make more friends. It's, it's, it's still, still the old year, man. It's still the old year. You can um, piss a few people. Sorry, man. Carry but, on. But, but one of the... Um, <laughs> if we just take, take a brief step back, the big debate now of our time, in a way, and the, the, the debate raging in social science and mm. also Mm -hmm. filtering out to these conversations is, is all of this change about economics or is all of this change about culture? Mm -hmm. And everybody who's smart says that's a ridiculous framework. It's clearly about how they both interact mm -hmm. and which one is dominant. And I think 2020 in the US is fascinating because it gives us really a natural experiment through which we can see these economic concerns on the one hand and these cultural concerns on the other play out in real time. Mm. Trump, as I've explained, similar, the only thing, I mean, Trump and Johnson are completely different characters, yeah. and I won't waste my time explaining why, even though there are lots of journalists, mainly on the liberal left, that like to draw this incredibly mm. simplistic line because the only thing they have is catastrophizing. Mm. That's the only thing certain people in this debate now have, which is, it is the return of fascism because that makes them feel like they have this self-importance that they've been validated and that they are their analysis is sort of superior to others and they can't they don't have the bandwidth and the 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 thought power to think anything else mm. and it's um Anyway, so the US 2020 election for me, I mean Trump has an inbuilt advantage, right? He's talking about economic protectionism and standing up to China. And he's talking about cultural protectionism in terms of building the wall, clamping down on migration. Um, so he has an inbuilt advantage. Um, he may struggle again to win the popular vote, but in the key constituencies that he's going after, that gives him an inbuilt advantage. The Democrats currently, similar to Corbyn and Labour, are offering economic redistribution with cultural social liberalism. In fact, it's worse than that. It's like hyper liberalism, yeah. mm. as Zach Goldberg and people in the States have been showing mm. on Twitter. Um, the liberal sections of the liberal Democrat left have, have responded to 2016 by doubling down in quite an extreme way on their liberal outlook, becoming, you know, much more positive toward uh, um, uh, minority groups becoming much more hostile toward members of their own group, particularly sort of white working class uh, voters becoming more supportive of open borders and all of these kinds of things in the same way that Remainers, to a lesser degree, mm. double down on their mm. support for migration and freedom of movement and so on. But that's not a convincing reply to this moment that we're in because you're never going to get these voters back on side. And I think if Trump ends up winning again, um, the reason I thought he'd win the first time was because he was speaking on these two dimensions that that um, Clinton was unable to 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 meet, but if he wins again, I mean the psychological blow to not just the Democrats but to liberalism mm. is going to be huge because it's going to tell us that actually, firstly they've completely squandered, and I include myself as a, as a I'd say I'm fairly liberal on some issues, um, but they squandered the post 2016 moment. They have failed to find a formula that can reconnect with voters and repair those relationships. 
And uh, I think it would be devastating if there is a second defeat in, the row, uh, in a row, in the same way that for Labour and Corbyn. I think it's absolutely devastating that after nearly a decade of conservative power, austerity mm. and economic squeeze, ongoing inequality, the best they could do was um, uh, you know, the, the worst number of seats since 1935. And th these are massive problems. And, and I think the US 2020 will give us more evidence of that. Do you think Boris Johnson and Trump, I know you say it's, it's facile to make connections between these two, but they tap into something deeper for me. Like I talk to a lot of people on the left and a lot of where they seem to be coming from is uh, you should essentially should be ashamed to be British. You should be ashamed to be American. You should be ashamed to be white, our colonial past, all the rest of it. And Johnson and Trump are going, no, you should be proud to be American. You should be proud to be British. And that's a far more positive message. And a lot of the times, uh, you know, we, we were at Kilconomics, an uh, economics festival in Ireland. And a lot of what these liberal economists seem to be saying is like, well, it's, it's the end of the West. It's the end of the Americans. What are you going to do? We're all fucked. And then you have someone coming along like Trump going, absolutely not. Let's make America great again. I think optimism is definitely part of it. We all have an optimism bias. I mean, psychologists talk a lot about this. Smokers convinced they'll never get lung cancer. They're not optimistic mm. about the, the outcomes. I, I think uh, mm. where the right um, or conservatives, what they've recognized, um, I think, firstly, is that um, people are far more attached still to the nation than the liberal left mm. recognizes. Mm. If you ask people in surveys, will you fight for your country if there was a war tomorrow, 80, 90% say, absolutely. You know, do you feel proud to live in your country? All of those kinds of metrics. The nation for most people is still fundamentally the one of the chief reference points mm. uh, in, in, in their life. And um, the, the direction of parts of the liberal left is, is moving very quickly away from that and isn't able then to speak to those voters because it's just promising a sort of diffuse, um, confusing, kind of incoherent argument about moving to supranational institutions and seemingly not having a problem with more churn and change and the disruption of the few things that voters really, really care about, tradition, uh, ways of life, um, community and belonging. And then someone at this point usually says, well, those things are all proxy for racism. <laughs> but, but they're not. No. They're really no. not. No. And, and, and there are racists who vote for Trump and there are racists who vote for conservative parties in, in Europe. But, but most people are not. And most people um, actively distance themselves from um, those expressions of intolerance. And the more that you're simply um, proclaiming to know what what those people are and, and you're adopting this um, uh, sort of inaccurate portrayal of them, the more they're going to backlash. I mean, the, the one, one of the most popular narratives on the liberal left over the last 10, 20 years has been that there is an inevitable um, uh, liberal destiny mm. that is simply going to arrive through migration and the rise of the university educated middle class. But what and that narrative was very popular when Trump was first just before mm. Trump was first elected, because people like Stan Greenberg and other Democrats were arguing there's absolutely no way Trump can win because of this newly ascendant liberal majority. Mm. But of course, what that sent was a message to voters that that really didn't want that liberal majority, that this was their last chance, mm. their last chance mm. to push back against that, that liberal consensus, that value set. And they took it in the same way that in the 2019 election in Britain, a lot of voters you know, um, uh, saw this as quite a critical watershed moment yeah. in a broader value struggle. Um, and so they were willing to override their traditional party loyalties because they felt that on balance, Johnson was probably the horse to back mm. in that broader conflict. I guess what, what I'm hearing out of everything that you've said today is that this is a correction that has been coming for a very long time because our mindset, particularly here in London, in the, in the, in the bubble of Westminster and the cultural bubble that Francis and I are in, our, our views as a society have been shaped by a very small number of people whose views are completely not representative of the rest mm. of the country. And the election of Boris Johnson, the election of Trump, the, the Brexit referendum, 
potentially what might happen in America next year. This is a correction against all of that. The way that I would view it is that the post the 1960s liberal revolutions, there was a lot of overreach. There was a lot of overreach that went, you know, what started with very legitimate, uh, you know, uh, concerns about minority rights, and rights for same-sex couples, um, uh, environmentalism, and all of those things that there needed to be a correction at that point in time. Mm. But through the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, I think there's a view that I'm sympathetic to that there, what started as a, an attempt to fix these very legitimate grievances then began to overreach and began to, it was sort of couldn't stop itself. It was just looking for, you know, any new possible identity, any new way of defining people by difference, not by what they had in common and, and sort of liberalism turned into this kind of really bad version of itself. It just kind of, you know, went on steroids and it, and it started to overreach. And I look at really what's been happening in Europe really since the late 80s through the 90s into the 2000s as as a correction to that as gradually conservative and populist parties began to then sort of back, backlash against hyperliberalism i think what worries me about where we are today is we're now beginning to see if you like the backlash to the backlash which is now liberals in the US and the UK and elsewhere doubling down and mm. saying actually I'm not going to do the one thing that will get us through this period which is compromise I'm not going to acknowledge the things that we have in common look at even the first few days of Boris Johnson's premiership um, you can look at the Johnson premiership and you can say, well, actually, there are a lot of things here that we were asking for for a long time. Um, the rights of EU nationals guaranteed, um, more help for international students, scrapping the net migration target, um, adopting um, very um, preferable, favorable visa regimes for NHS workers and so on and so on and so on. All of these things that we spent mm. three years as, as a liberal left screaming about, shrieking about, mm. Actually, the conservatives are not doubling down on the sort of hostile environment. They seem to be making some concessions. Well, why don't we spend some time acknowledging that, focusing on that, building some compromise around that, instead of saying what they're saying now, which is Britain is turning into Hungary, right? Mm. Britain, the liberal um, catastrophizing. Britain is sliding into authoritarianism <laughs> because it's just the view is not able oh. to, to, to acknowledge some of the things where there is common ground. So anyway, I think um, in general, um, what worries me is you're now beginning to see, partly through the politics of climate change, which I think are going to be fascinating, um, but also through the rise of green movements in Europe, through the direction of the uh, Democrat voters that I've talked to and the Democrat activists, and also I think through the direction of the Brit British Labour Party, you're seeing a backlash to that backlash. And that, the, the end result of all of that would just be polarization. Mm because you've got these two sides now basically dug in um, and they've got, they've got representatives, they've got political parties that have adapted to speak on their behalf and um, the compromise, the middle ground, the nuance, the ambiguity gets shut down, which is why I find some of the academic debates so frustrating mm. because academics often adopt the same um, binary language as the populace by saying you're either you're either with us on the left or you're legitimizing hatred. nationalism and hatred. There's no yeah. marketplace of ideas there. It's it's just as binary as the populace that many of them are studying. So I think it's um, that that does genuinely worry me because uh, we need to try and figure out a way of propping up. Matt, know. every time, so it's the second time we've interviewed you, and every time I come away and I think, I should have asked him that question. And I know it's a very difficult question to ask, and it's predictions, and predictions are always odious because it's so difficult to get wrong. But nevertheless, I'm going to ask you it. Are we watching the slow death of the EU? Not the death of the EU, but um, the, EU, the challenges facing the European Union, possibly the contraction of the European Union, I think, are, are beginning not ending. Um, the, I'm very pessimistic about the European Union for many ways. I wouldn't describe myself as a Brexiteer, um, but I, I was certainly, um, I've certainly spent the last few years questioning whether the European Union has what it takes to remedy the multiple challenges mm -hmm. that it's facing. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, those challenges are well known. It's aging, it's not productive enough, it's divided between, I mean, being quite crude, but east and west over values, north and south over economic redistribution. There has not appeared much solidarity at key moments when it was required, and there doesn't appear to be uh, much of a uh, an answer coming from um, sort of elites within the EU sphere uh, in terms of what to do about any of that. And then when you look at the longer term kind of projections and trends with regards to the pressure that the EU and the Eurozone are going to come under from you know, US China, from population change in Africa, from uh, cent Central and Eastern uh, European states depopulating, shrinking. Um, the EU needs a radical, forward-looking, um, sensible policy agenda and, and foremost needs leadership. And currently there is a leadership vacuum um, within the European Union. The response to Brexit, I think, has been very revealing, kind of inability to really digest what is at the heart, the root of Euroscepticism. And populism, if anything, this year, 2019, populism has consolidated. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just struck on, on Twitter during the European elections as watching the number of people trying to kind of spin this as being a really bad set of elections for parties that are Eurosceptic. I mean, when you saw the share of seats in the European Parliament for Eurosceptic parties has now reached a record high. And we've seen party systems that we were told when, when I was doing my PhD, at least, you know, early 2000s, places like Germany and Sweden, um, you know, have basically fragmented um, and have become much less stable kind of political systems. Meanwhile, you know, populists in control of Italy, breaking through in Spain, which, which again, we were always told wouldn't happen. Um, and if anything, the kind of harder right governments in Central and Eastern Europe have become stronger. But there's a lot of wishful thinking out there. There's a lot of people that actually don't want to you know, they, they get very excited about the, the rise of a couple of Green parties, <laughs> but aren't actually, I would argue, at least in the public conversation and discussion, still, I mean, we talked about this in national populism, still sort of covering themselves with comfort blankets. It's all about imports from China. It's all about austerity and the legacy of the financial crisis. Whereas I think actually this era of disruption is just beginning, yeah. you know, and uh, there's not going to be an easy answer for, for the European Union, I don't think it will collapse at all. I think it will have to um, contract further. And I suspect one or two states in Southern Europe probably won't, won't be in the European Union 20, 30 years from now. And I'm happy to be wrong about that, but I just don't think it's sustainable to keep, for example, Italians living the way they're living, not having any significant increase in living standards and not feeling respected. And you said earlier on about language, respect, um, dignity, and recognition um, are words that we don't hear a lot about when we're talking about election outcomes and why people are revolting, but, but they're incredibly important. Mm. And emotion in politics is incredibly important. Mm. And in my world, in political science, we really don't talk about emotion in, in as big a way as psychologists do, because we think it's all about institutions and party vessels and leaders. and But when you think about emotion as a potent tool of voting behavior, then in Europe, you know, I think it's um, it's potentially going to be very significant. You know, blame, um, you know, hope, aspiration, and all of these things. Uh, I think the European Union will struggle to, to respond to them. Matt, it's been a great interview, and thank you so much for coming back. You guys can see why we were delighted to have Matt back on the show. Uh, before we let you go, which we must do now because you're a busy man, you've been all over the, the TV studios for the last week talking to people about what's happened. The last question we always ask is, what is the one thing that no one's talking about that we should be talking about? And it can be absolutely anything at all. Well, I think lots of people are talking about it, um, but I, I'm now increasingly convinced, I think the politics of climate change is going to be the next huge, big, disruptive moment in, in, in our political world. I think we haven't even begun to interrogate what that means for traditional party allegiances. Give us a 30-second for... summary of, of, the, of the whole thing. What's going to happen with that? Well, I think it's going to become partly a new culture war. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the conservative parties are going to have to move very quickly on it to say actually the most conservative thing in the world is to be thinking about environmentalism in, mm. a, in, a, in a reasonable, sensible way. Um, and I think we're going to have some really entrenched 
as an issue, I think is going to bring out the generational, I don't want to say conflicts, but the generational tensions that we can already see mm -hmm. emerging. <coughs> if you look at Generation Z's views on, the, mm -hmm. on that issue versus the, the baby boomers, you know, some real interesting tensions emerging there. And, you know, in terms of how it's going to disrupt political systems, you know, green parties perhaps eating into traditional left-wing parties to a much greater degree, um, and how the right responds to that, I mean, has to start thinking about that now, because I think the pace of that political change will be, will be, uh, will be very, very, uh, very big, very quick. Sorry. Fascinating stuff. Uh, make sure if you want a de in in-depth analysis of all this stuff, make sure to get Matt's book, National Populism, The Revolt Against Liberal Democracy. Uh, follow him on Twitter. You're a great follow on Twitter, man. During the election, you're posting all the polls and stuff, and I'm sure there'll be lots of stuff that you're putting out. So follow Matt on Twitter. We'll put uh, we'll put the, his username in, in the video. And we will see you in a week's time with another brilliant episode. Take care. See you next week, guys. Thanks for watching guys, as always subscribe to the YouTube channel, click the bell button next to the subscribe button so you get notified when a video comes out and follow us on all the social media at TriggerPod. And also leave us a nice review on iTunes and spread the word.